Hidden amongst the stands of live oak and cypress along Florida's Suwannee River Basin, one discovers wondrous jewels of nature in the form of sapphire blue freshwater springs. These magical pools have mystified and enchanted humans for millennia. Our ancestors believed that spirits lived within these springs, while conquistadors imagined that they held the secret of eternal life. Staring into their sunlit depths, we find a deeper connection to ourselves and a sense of wonder that's difficult to put into words. The secrets of these natural wonders remained unknowable to man until the invention of the aqualung. From that point forward, anyone with a sense of adventure and the willingness to take a chance could explore these natural treasures. As this new breed of explorer descended upon Florida Springs, it became clear that beyond the beauty lay one of the most unforgiving environments on earth. A diver lost every weekend, according to the residents of Louisville, Florida. The pathway to disaster was simple. Divers were drawn into underwater caverns that were beautiful and full of light. There, they became mesmerized by air-clear water and followed a desire to explore that which lay beyond. They were unaware that beneath the caverns awaited mile upon mile of water-filled cave, an underground river locked in perpetual darkness. The divers that got into the most trouble were the ones with the lights, because they were able to leave the cavern and its connection to the surface without even knowing it. Once in the cave, a host of silent killers awaited, including unending absolute darkness blinding clouds of silt, and no direct access to air. The odds of survival were not good. The reaper signs that guard cave entrances today still bear the images of the grisly legacy from the earliest days of exploration. Eventually, leaders emerged who championed cave diving safety through training. New rules, equipment, and techniques were developed specifically for the challenges of the underwater cave. At the core of safety was the use of the continuous guideline. From the daylight of the cavern zone, throughout the dive, and back again. Altogether, these changes stemmed the tide of fatalities and laid the foundation for what is cave diving today. Sheck Exley one of the greatest cave divers that ever lived, and a personal hero to me, emerged early as a steadfast champion of cave diving safety. Looking back, it seems clear that the first seed of his devotion to safety was planted in 1967 at Peacock 1, when he encountered his first close call as a cave diver, becoming Peacock's first victim, almost. Sheck was a math teacher in Suwannee County, Florida, and a world leader in the exploration of underwater caves. He is famous for his record-setting, expedition-level cave dives, undaunted courage, and as a champion of cave diving safety. He's now regarded fondly as both pioneer and legend, but he was also a writer. During his life, he authored several works describing the adventures and misadventures of the pioneers who dared to explore the sinkholes and underwater caves of Florida. If you're a cave diver and you haven't read these, you're in for a treat. My favorites are Caverns Measureless to Man and The Taming of the Slough. I read both of these when I first started cave diving, and then many years later, I read them again. The second time I read Taming of the Slough, I noticed one section stood out from the rest. It was the story of what became one of Sheck's most important dives. He called it Lost in the Slough. I vaguely remembered it from my first reading, but now I was transfixed. What grabbed my attention was this. He wrote, I turned back and to my horror came to intersection after intersection where two or three tunnels, all of which looked like the right one, went off in different directions as far as I could see. What sounded like a cave diver's nightmare really was. This is what Sheck had experienced when he took on Peacock One without a guideline. It gave me the creeps, but at the same time it was fascinating. I had to know more. Here's the story in a nutshell. In 1967, on his 19th cavern or cave dive, Sheck went into Peacock 1 for the first time. He went in alone with a single 72, but more importantly, 
He went in without a guideline. He swam hundreds of feet from the entrance through a maze of tunnels he had never seen before. Then, when he turned the dive, he ran smack into the horrific maze described above. Though confused at first, he figured out the maze and headed for the cave exit. And then it happened, that life-changing moment. He spotted the cave exit and sped into it, expecting to find the way back to the cavern. But when he looked up, he saw nothing but limestone. Shocked to the core, he wrote that he knew he was lost and started swimming faster. His regulator started breathing hard. He pulled his J-valve and he knew he had four minutes. His light darted to and fro in the darkness. He kept searching, but in the expanding cloud of silt, the darkness closed in. He never found the exit by which he had entered the cave. but he did find an impossibly small crack that led upward through the ceiling. He squeezed into this tiny crevice sideways and got stuck. He could barely breathe. Wriggling to get through, he looked upward and through the boulders above saw the faint glow of daylight. He knew instantly he was seeing cavern light and started thrashing around like a beast. He broke the grip of the stone and made his way back to the light. He never entered a cave again without a guideline. Sheck was a teenager in high school when he did this dive, reckless and indestructible, like so many of us at that age. But he wasn't just any teenager. This brave young prodigy was destined to become a legend, and this near miss, instrumental in putting him on that path. His story lost in the slough has elements of both mystery and miracle, and it left me wanting to know more. Why didn't he have a guideline? Did he really get 400 feet into the cave? What route did he take? Where is this mysterious crevice in the ceiling? How did he escape the horrific maze? And how did he memorize his way in and out for 800 feet and then get lost in the last 50 feet? To find the answers, I talked to people that knew Sheck well and studied the details of the dive in Sheck's two books. I then fit these clues to the cave as best I could. The answers that we found were not at all what I expected as we uncovered details that added a new perspective to this 50-year-old adventure. To illustrate the dives in this film, I used the Peacock Springs Cave System map. The stick version was completed in 1977 by team leader Sheck Exley, while the fully surveyed version, the one seen here, was completed in 1996 by team leader Mike Poucher. The lines that you see on the map represent tunnels, 28,000 feet of them. Sheck's dive happened in this section down here, the first 460 feet of the cave. It's easier to see when we blow it up. This is the cavern zone here. These circles represent boulders. And this represents a vertical crack going from the cavern to the cave zone from 45 to 65 feet. There's a permanent guideline in the cave these days called the gold line or the main line. There was no goal line in 1967 just a muddy cave floor. It starts in the cavern and goes all the way to Pothole Sink and beyond, providing the direction to the exit under all conditions. This is the Gold Line Tunnel. This is the Well Line Tunnel. And this is the intersection of the Well Line and the Gold Line. I refer to it several times during the film. To understand this dive, you have to know its place in time. It's 1967, the Wild West period of cave diving. There are no rules. People make up their own. There's no BCs, just Clorox jugs. People use J-valves instead of pressure gauges. Lights are 4 watt or less and unreliable. It was a dark period in many ways. But this period was about to end as a hero emerged from the chaos. From this perspective, Let's take a look at Lost in the Slough. As it turns out, there were several reasons why Sheck went into the cave that day without a guideline. First, Sheck didn't know that he needed a guideline. He knew he should have one, but he didn't know he needed one. This is what he learned on this dive. Sheck and his buddy, Tommy Hawkins, had a guideline on their previous dive. A nylon string wrapped around a coffee can. It came unraveled and almost drowned them. They opted to leave it on the bank for this dive. Another big factor was this. Sheck had been in P1 two weeks earlier. He wrote that he saw this mysterious blue slit where the goal line enters the cave today, 
but he didn't have the gas to do the dive. As he left, he wrote that the crack beckoned to him as the sirens to Odysseus. So now he's back here after dreaming about this dive for two weeks. He's all gassed up and ready to get it on. Renowned cave explorer Paul Deloach, veteran of Wakulla, Cathedral, and Falmouth, did nearly 300 dives with Sheck, who called him Uncle Paul on the one hand and Hardcore on the other. Paul said that when Sheck had his mind set on something, there was nothing going to stop him. I think it was just that simple. Sheck had his mind set on doing this dive, and he believed he could do it without a guideline. I first heard about Sheck and his rule of thirds back in the 70s in diving school at Jensen Beach. Use one third of your air going in, one third going out, and one third for safety. Sheck wrote that he got nearly 400 feet into the cave that day, but how close was this to his third? We were debating the best way to figure this out. Kathy Lesh said, just do it. She was right. To see the dive from Sheck's perspective, I had to do it. And so began the recreation of Lost in the Slough. Andy Higgy threw us his GoPro as we left the shop. He says, I gotta have pictures of this. So the plan was this. I would swim into P1 as far as I could with a single 72 cubic foot tank to find the range of my third, which I could then use to compare with Sheck's. To do this, I used my old Decor kidney pack and a smoking hot 72 filled to 2100 pounds. I settled on this pressure because it was between 2000 and 2250, both of which were quoted as being common fills in the area in 1967. For safety, I carried redundant backups, and my buddy Paul Clark is a safety diver, and I wore a six cubic foot backup tank on my belt with a regulator on a necklace so I could get to Paul if I lost my primary. Sheck didn't have a BC since they weren't invented yet, so to match his drag, I didn't use one either. My seven mil top, provided almost all the flotation I needed and gave me a horizontal pitch also. Sheck had a different approach to compensate for the lack of his BC. I describe this later in the film in detail. Here's the way the 50th anniversary dive went. The cavern profile was aligned with what Sheck wrote in Taming of the Slough. The cave profile was improvised because I didn't know Sheck's route. I just followed the main line. After checking my backup, I dove down through the cavern, down the goal line crevice to the cave, and then paused, imagining that I was Sheck with my buddy Tommy Hawkins staring at a muddy cave floor. At this point, I headed back toward the entrance because Tommy pulled his J-valve and wanted to get out. Sheck escorted him back to make sure he got out safely, and then he went back down to the bottom of the fissure and headed out into the cave. I turned around to memorize what the crack looked like, right about where the sign is today. You would too without a guideline. I guarantee it. We didn't plan on filming this dive and really didn't have a light to do the job, so the cave photos really weren't good. It's easier to illustrate the dive with a map. This is the way the dive went. We swam down to the bottom of the crack, back to the entrance to let Tommy out, then back down to the crack and headed into the cave following the main line. At this point during Sheck's dive, he wrote that he soon realized this was a very different kind of cave. I stayed on the main line because I didn't know Sheck's route until I hit my thirds at about 350 feet. This wasn't as far as Sheck got with his nearly 400 feet, but it was close, and I'm not a legend, so I call this the 72 line and headed back for the entrance. Just as I had on the way in, I followed the main line all the way back until I got to the intersection of the well line and the gold line. I stopped at this point and just looked around pretending to be Sheck to see what I could see. At the intersection of the well line and the gold line, the spot where Sheck got into trouble, what I found amazed me. I couldn't see the goal line exit from that vantage point. You have to go around the corner to have a clear line of sight, but it's way back up here in the darkness. With a 50 lumen light, you wouldn't see it. With no guideline to follow, Sheck's memory would have been useless at this key intersection. This clearly could have been part of the problem why he never found the goal line exit. I got back to the cavern with 900 pounds showing. Sheck returned with 600 at best. 
He couldn't have turned on thirds technically, because he didn't have a pressure gauge, but I think he was close. I imagined Sheck down below fighting to find his way out, when it hit me. That after making it out, Sheck had to see that that 600 pound of gas bought him the time he needed to find a new way out. Which begs the question, did the seed for the rule of thirds get planted on this dive? Before leaving the cavern, we started looking for that impossibly small crevice that led upward through the ceiling, Sheck's escape route. I checked going down toward the well line. This exit wasn't impossibly small. It wasn't so tight that your arm was pinned under your side, as Sheck described. From what I could see, a manatee could exit from the well line, no trouble. That definitely wasn't it. Out of time, we exited the cave and headed back to the surface. I was just glad to get out of there. I'll take my 85s in classic wing any day. My dive buddy, Gene Nelson, named three other exit points from P1 Cave to the cavern, besides the well line exit. The goal line exit, a skinny extension of the goal line exit just to the right of it going out, and a small hole far to the right of the goal line, all the way against the right wall in the corner. We can rule out the goal line since Sheck exited the cave from a crevice that was completely different from the one he entered. I don't think it was a skinny extension because it ain't that skinny. Divers have no trouble ascending this crack. This leaves the tiny crevice in the corner as the most likely candidate. In Sheck's stories, I found other descriptions of the impossibly small crevice through which he had made his miraculous escape. He wrote that, I came to another dead end and started to go back when I noticed a crevice leading upward through the ceiling. The dead end description fits this opening nicely. As you can see, it's set back in a cubby hole and is in a corner. He also wrote, I started to go back, suggests that the exit was not readily apparent or somehow hidden. This description makes sense, for when you approach the cubby hole, this limestone projection blocks the crevice from view. It looks like you're approaching a dead end. You have to be right up on it before you can look around the projection to see a narrow crevice. Collectively, I think this exit best fits the description of Sheck's escape route. Having found his exit, I wanted to find the horrific maze that so terrified Sheck that day. But to do this, I needed to solve another puzzle first, and that was, where did he see the cave split into three identical conduits? And why is this so important? Because he also wrote that he swam into the middle conduit and shortly thereafter swam into the maze. I was pretty sure that the three identical conduits had to be where the cave branches about 200 feet in. The mystery is this, the cave only has two conduits. So this third conduit was really some kind of illusion. It just looked like a conduit. We know Sheik headed toward Pothole Sink, and since BCs didn't exist, he had to swim rapidly near the ceiling to stay off the bottom. After a hundred feet of this, he got tired and dropped to the floor to rest and memorize where he was. He would then take off again, leapfrogging through the cave in hundred foot increments or so. This brought him to the 200 foot mark on his second swim. Sheck left the goal line crack and headed out to his first touchdown point, 100 feet into the cave. From this position, Sheck wrote that he saw to his right a tunnel of equal size doubling back, and to his left, he wrote that the cave swerved to the left and split into three identical conduits. This is the spot Sheck was talking about using modern cave lights. If you want to see what Sheck saw, you have to use a 4 watt light or less. Your pupils have to be fully dilated, so no modern lights on the way down into the cave. Take your time getting to the spot and you'll see the three conduits. When Sheck was rested, he headed out to his second touchdown point. At the 200 foot mark, he saw the first conduit going this way. Then, I think he swam over to the left to survey that side. As he crossed over, he had to see the pillar that looks like Atlas. After finding the left conduit, I think he turned back toward the middle to make his assault. 
This is his view from within the cave. He saw the first conduit going that way, then moved on. He hasn't landed yet. He hasn't done his touchdown point yet. He's heading out. He sees the other conduit over there. It's much bigger. He circles back and touches down somewhere right about here. I think this is what Shek called his middle conduit. I think as he sat here resting, he was transfixed by this pillar. It doesn't look like any other pillar in the cave. I think he said, I'm going to go down this middle conduit right here because then I'll have this on my right side. It's a good landmark. When I come back, it's like a breadcrumb. I'll find it and I'll know I'm coming back the right way. Shek headed through the middle conduit with the atlas pillar on his right and a long straight wall on his left. He headed out further into the cave and pretty soon he saw the cave open wide to the right. I think he didn't go out to that open area but stayed on that wall. I think it would feel better until he came to this archway where he landed again another touchdown point in the archway to survey the intersection ahead. Here's the view from the cave. After swimming past the atlas pillar on his right, he stayed on this nice left wall, kicked it into high gear. Remember, he's got no BC. He's staying near the ceiling to try to stay off the cave floor, to try to not kick up silt. He's got no guideline. Right about here, he's thinking, you know, I'm going to stick to this wall. I don't want to get out in that area. That's not going to be, that won't, that won't be good. So he kicks, keeps going along the left wall. I think it felt better. And he gets to right about this archway right here. And this is about 100 feet, so he's getting tired. And this is a good spot for him to fall to the floor to rest. Sheck wrote that I came to an intersection where another tunnel about the same size as the one I was in crossed it at a right angle. He also wrote, since I had no safety line, I should have stopped here, but the excitement of exploration was pounding through my veins. From his new position, he saw a big archway to his right, a tunnel directly ahead, and another to his left that was difficult to see. After thinking about it, he chose to go through the arch to the right because it had the largest archway, and there are no other outstanding landmarks at this intersection. He kept it simple. Right fork, big arch. How do I know he went to the right? You'll see on the way back. From his third touchdown point, he headed through the big archway and then bore to the left into the largest part of the tunnel, leading deeper into the cave, until he got to this point where he wrote, although the place soon became a regular maze, I just kept going a little bit further. His next stop was the 72 line. He was now nearly 400 feet into the cave. Concerned about his remaining air and light, he turned around and headed back. When he entered the big archway, he expected to see three dissimilar tunnels, but what he wrote was this, in the dim glow of my light, both passages looked identical. He also wrote that both tunnels looked like the right one. This was definitely not what he was expecting to see, and it really scared him. Did I miss a turn? We all know doubt is not your friend down here. You can see why the tunnels looked identical by checking the Peacock map. From his perspective in the big archway, the walls directly across from him faded into the darkness at the same angle. It's like looking down the tip of a triangle toward the base. The tunnels are the same width and height and have equally large empty spaces adjacent to them on both sides. Any diver without a guideline would be hard pressed to pick the right one. This is the only vantage point in the cave where you can get this view of two identical tunnels. This is how we know he turned right through the big archway on his way in but there's more. Confused, he moved in further to investigate, and this is where he saw the third tunnel. He wrote, To my horror, I came to intersection after intersection, where two or three tunnels, all of which looked like the right one, would go off in different directions as far as I could see. I think this is what he saw, two tunnels in one intersection, and then three tunnels with yet another intersection. No other route in the cave fits these clues so well. What really happened was this. When Sheck saw that third tunnel, he was relieved because now he knew exactly where he was and which way to go. He remembered that that third tunnel was directly across from the one that led to the exit. He turned on the afterburners, passed over his third touchdown point in the mud, 
got back on that long straight wall, now on his right-hand side, and shortly thereafter, he sighted the Atlas Pillar and knew he was on the right path home. His adrenaline level started coming down. He was home free. Or so he thought. He was about to run into what he called his first dead end. This is what derailed the dive in the last 50 feet. Its whereabouts remained a mystery. Fortunately, we knew the position of his second dead end, the tiny crevice by which he had escaped the cave. Rounding the next corner, he came to the intersection of the well line and the goal line. When Sheck arrived here in a hurry, he knew exactly where he was. He knew the way out was somewhere to the right, but what he didn't know was how far to the right. Looking at the cave map helps us put this in perspective. Here's Sheck at the intersection. Here's the tiny crevice, the second dead end. That means that first dead end, it's got to be right here, right here somewhere. Andrew Higgy and I studied that spot in detail, and what we found was not what I expected, but it is what it had to be all along, something that Sheck believed to be the exit. But when Sheck arrived back at the intersection, expecting to see this, he found this instead. His leapfrogging through the cave had created a silt storm that was piling up at the exit. The smoky water was limiting the range he could see and the distance his light would travel. This is why he wrote that he knew the exit was to the right, but he didn't know how far to the right, because he couldn't see it. At this point, I think Sheck was beginning to lose hope. He realized he was in a situation that he couldn't deal with. I think his forward momentum stalled. And rather than just wander around aimlessly, I think he just fell to the floor to rest right about here and started scanning, looking for the exit. This is Sheck's view from his final touchdown point. In the corner over here is the tiny crevice, his second dead end. But what does an exit look like? In this case, it looks like the one that he memorized on the way in. This is where Sheck entered the cave that day. This is what he was looking for. The funny thing about vertical exits is this. You don't really see the crack until you're right up under it looking up. What you see instead is this. You see limestone in the foreground, like this, and then limestone in the background. Your brain fills in the blanks. You expect to see the crack going upward. While Sheck couldn't see the goal line exit, he could see this right in front of him. This formation is on this wall, just 10 feet from the tiny crevice. It looks like an exit, with limestone in the foreground and limestone behind. His brain filled in the blank making him believe there was a vertical crack to the cavern right behind there. But there wasn't. This was a false lead. When he looked up, expecting to see the way back to the cavern, he saw nothing but limestone. This was his first dead end. His blood ran cold. He wrote that he knew he was lost and started thrashing about. At almost the same moment, his regulator began to breathe hard. He knew what that meant. He had to pull his J-valve, and he hoped that he hadn't bumped it on the cave ceiling already. When he pulled it, he could breathe again. He knew he had 500 PSI. He had to find a way out. He knew the exit was nearby somewhere. I came to another dead end. I started to go back when I noticed a tiny crevice leading upward through the ceiling. It didn't look at all familiar, but it was heading in the right direction. But then I saw maybe I should go back and find the real way out. It's got to be close by. But when he turned around, all of that thrashing about had caught up with him. A silk cloud was following behind him and was beginning to head up the crevice. It was the devil or the deep blue sea. Sheck chose the deep blue sea. He wrote that he started praying to God and making promises that he later forgot. He dug into the crack face down and pulled, but he was too tight. He rolled onto his side. It was so tight he could barely breathe. As he looked upward through the boulders, he began to see a faint glow of daylight. Sheck's primal struggle set him free of the cave's grip. He made it back to the light and to Tommy. Sheck didn't forget the way out of the cave after all. Instead, his memory was deceived by false leads and hidden exits. 
These things a guideline would have defeated while taking him straight to the exit. This was seared into his memory. Through that tiny crevice, a new diver was born, one destined to become a cave diving legend and the champion of cave diving safety. Sheck proposed the rule of thirds the next year and later authored the Dixie Cavern King's Cave Manual, the first published rules of cave diving. Rule number one, take a guideline. Later, he authored his signature work, Basic Cave Diving, a Blueprint for Survival. Section one, the guideline. During his life, Sheck set diving records one after another, but as time goes on, we see that his greatest legacy was really for laying the foundation of safe cave diving. Every time we make it back to the light, we make a connection to Sheck's living legacy. We're fortunate that Sheck was a writer because it provides us a window to the past where we find that Lost in the Slough was the rough cut version of what was to come. It was the 800 foot version of Sheck's future, the daring explorer pushing the limits of his gear, his endurance, and his dedication to his craft to the very edge. In the end, legends are born on the edge, and they always will be. They're out there right now, towing the line between the possible and the impossible.